Welcome to episode one of the I Am Salt Lake podcast. My name is Chris Hollifield, and I am excited to bring you this brand new podcast uh, showcasing a side of Salt Lake that Salt Lake City, Utah, you might not be familiar with. Uh, hopefully I can have some different interviews and bring some gifts on here of people and local business owners that you might be a little less familiar with. Uh, feel free to go to the website, IamSaltLake.com, hit the contact information for the many different ways to get in touch with me if you have ideas, suggestions for the podcast, or if you would like to even possibly be interviewed. Again, the website is IamSaltLake.com. You can also contact us. We have a voicemail uh, number. That number is area code 385. It's one of the new local area codes here. 385-202-5926. Feel free to call us up and tell us what you think of the show uh, and any tips or suggestions you might have. Uh, I got a lot of fun ideas planned for this show, but I couldn't think of a more perfect person to bring on to the first episode and have an interview and conversation with other than my wife, Suzanne Hollifield, who does Sorry Clementine clothing here in Salt Lake City, Utah. We're going to be discussing everything from how she went from selling exclusively online to a, to a more exclusive Salt Lake City, Utah market. Uh, from her selling every Saturday to Funk Farmer's Market to Unhinged Clothing here in Sugar House, as well as her personal life, what she likes to do outside of sewing. So what I uh, ask you to do now is just sit back, relax, and enjoy the conversation uh, that myself and Suzanne had. And thank you for listening to I Am Salt Lake. Okay, so why don't you go ahead and tell us how long you've been doing Sorry Clementine clothing. Um, I've been doing Sorry Clementine for about eight years now. When I first started sewing and making clothes and doing it as a business, I, I started under a different name. And slowly I kind of, it was really defining the name, the old name of it, and... I felt kind of pigeonholed, and so I decided to change the name about halfway into it. And so, about four years now, I've been doing Sorry Clementine. Okay, and so what first attracted you to sewing as well as getting into fashion and design? What really attracted me was being able to make the clothing that I wanted to wear. Um, when I was younger, I couldn't find a lot of the clothes, like styles of clothes that I wanted to wear. And so I slowly started making my own and doing a lot of like reconstructing and cutting things up to kind of even see how they fit together. And um, it mostly stemmed out of wanting to be able to make my own things. And correct me if I'm wrong, but you've had no sort of education when it comes to sewing, correct? You're all self-taught. Yeah, no formal training at all. Um... Just a lot of, I really, I'm, I'm a hands-on learner, and it's just been through a lot of trial and error throughout the years, um, slowly getting better and figuring out what I'm doing, and I really like that I'm self-taught. What, what are some of your inspirations? Uh, what inspires you to, to sew what, what you're sewing? What are... um, I like, just like personal preference-wise as far as design goes, I really like lines and um, color blocking and um, doing unusual shapes with clothing and putting pockets where they might not normally be and in different shapes. And um, I really like mixing prints and colors, um, kind of doing unusual color combinations. It kind of just stems from that place overall and then... I definitely get inspired by even the fabrics and materials that I work with. Sometimes I'll, I'll see a really pretty fabric and I love the print and that will kind of inspire me to be like, oh, I want to make this certain thing out of that. So, so in one sentence, describe the style of clothing that you design. Oh, that's hard. Um, a couple sentences. <laughs> I, I feel like I make... Um, just cute, comfortable, a little bit quirky and unusual, 
but still like very wearable. It, it feels like you're wearing a t-shirt, but looks way cuter. And it, you know, it may have a collar or an interesting pocket detail or anything like that. Which, speaking of your style, one thing that's always intrigued me is is, is how cheap and, and inexpensive your clothing is. I mean, is that is there a reason behind that? I mean, is that kind um, of... I, I definitely try to keep my prices lower, and I think for me overall, it's you have to keep it accessible. I don't feel like there's... I mean, there's a point to it, I guess, but I really feel like... I make clothing because I want people to wear it, mm -hmm. like first and foremost. At the end of the day, I love to sew, I love to design, but really, I make I make things because I want people to well, enjoy well, them. Well, it's hard for somebody to spend a hundred dollars on a t on a T-shirt or a dress and feel like they can wear it anywhere they go without well, worrying about ruining it. Absolutely, and I mean. Not everybody, I, I would say the majority of people can't afford to spend $100 on a shirt. I mean, you can't even barely afford to spend, I mean, I can't justify spending $100 on a shirt. And, you know, some of my peers, I mean, other clothing sellers on Etsy, some people have slightly cheaper prices, some people have more expensive prices, but for me it's just like, I get what I need out of my price. Mm -hmm. and I don't want to gouge my customer. I appreciate their support. And um, and it helps and, you create a fan base, I'm sure, because people can afford your clothing, oh, so, they, so they keep coming back for more and more and more, and it absolutely. creates an addiction. I've actually had a few customers like send me photos of um, their sorry Clementine portion of their closet, mm -hmm. and it's really insane. There's people that have been buying clothing from me for, I mean, five, six years, and I actually just had a customer bought a shirt off of Etsy just a few days ago, and she included in a little message, hey, I bought a shirt from you four years ago at Craft Lake City, this festival that I did, and she's like, and I still rock it all the time, and I just wanted to let you know that I love it, and so it's, like, I think about my wardrobe, and it's like, I don't know if I have anything that I bought four years ago that I still love to wear. Like, and that is still wearable and it's yeah. still even holding up, especially like, since it's handmade clothing. Yeah, I mean, it was very flattering. Each, and Each piece that you make is one of a kind, yeah. you know, beside your screen printing. Well, let's, let's actually back up a little bit here. When you first did start selling, you you sold strictly online, correct? Yes. Um, I When I first started selling the stuff that I made... Um, at the time, really, the only place to sell anything online was on eBay, and so that it it was fairly easy to learn how to sell on eBay. Um, it was it gave you such a broad audience, and so that's where I chose to. And there, there was quite things. a few sellers, people making handmade clothing on on eBay, correct? Yeah, there was a handful of us. It's been interesting to see kind of the evolution of online selling, especially with handmade things. When I started selling on eBay. Etsy did not exist at that point, and I would say there were maybe 10 to 15 um, handmade clothing sellers on eBay, and we kind of all like banded together actually, and kind of used all of our customer bases and networks and really kind of supported each other. It was really cool. You would think that there would have been more competition, but when there's so few... And then, you, just like, then you branched over to Etsy, correct? I mean, and then Etsy opened up, and, yeah, and you went over Etsy there. Yeah, as Etsy came about, it was just like, oh, wow. And it sounds silly now, because it's like, I feel like Etsy is almost like a household name, where it's yeah. like everybody knows about Etsy. And but at you, that time, nobody knew about it, and it was a brand new thing, and you're like, should I take a chance with this? Yeah, like when you're used to selling on eBay, and then a whole new um, selling marketplace comes about, especially that caters specifically to what you do, it was just like, whoa, this is really cool. And, yeah, I remember when Etsy first even got introduced, they were trying to decide if they would even let vintage items be yeah. on the site. And it was just, it was really new and really cool, and it was just like, whoa, this is an online marketplace just for handmade things. And now it's handmade and vintage and supplies, mm, but... But it was really... So when when did you decide to 
give local markets a try. Say Salt Lake, you know, branch out from Etsy, selling online exclusively to selling to a local market, which you happen to be in Salt Lake City. When did you first start selling? I decided to try selling things locally pretty much the first opportunity that I found. And I'm sure there were other things. And I mean, I know that there, in hindsight, there are other things and other events that I could have tried. But I just hadn't been exposed to them yet. And so the first event that seemed like, oh, this is, this is a type of festival event that seems like it would be a really good match for me. Um, I was reading Slug, this local magazine, one day, and they had an advertisement about this event called Craft Lake City, and I was just like, whoa, that sounds like perfect for what I do. And so I looked into it and applied and got accepted the very first year. And that's really when things shifted to selling more locally based. And this is actually, you just actually celebrated your fourth year yeah, fourth at year Craft, at Craft City. Lake City, correct, and you got an award and <laughs> yeah. all that cool stuff. It was actually stuff. really awesome. It was surprising to me. Um, there's so many, there's so many um, artists and crafters and all of that here in Salt Lake, and I was one of only 13 people that have done it all four years. I think a lot of people have done it the last three years, but there, um, there's there's not that many of us. There's only 13 of us that have done it all four years. And you also hand sew, you, you hand sewed 398 bags for the event as well. Yes, I did. And that was a pretty pretty crazy, <laughs> especially was... having to witness it, seeing it uh, <laughs> piles and piles of fabric and the Craft Lake City bag takeover. Takeover in our no, house. No, that was a really cool opportunity that was presented to me. Um, Angela, the editor of Slug, approached me about doing it, and I I really didn't even have to think about it. I was just like, yes, for sure, I really want to do that. And just the, the concept of the project really appealed to me of, you know, instead of outsourcing and having an out-of-state printing place print these and use bags made in China or wherever, it was just like every step of the process is going to be made here in Salt Lake City and we're keeping it local. And that was the first year that they did that yeah. with these bags, because every year they give like a bag of goodies to the to the mm -hmm. vendors and the volunteers. And yeah, and this, each, this each year, year the bags have been a little bit different, but this year was the first year that they um, wanted to to do them handmade, and I was really flattered that they approached me about doing it. And it's probably kind of cool to see people carrying. Oh yeah, it was really cool. Like even at the beginning around. of the day, before things got crazy and stuff, you see all these different people walking around with bags that you made. And it was cool, too, because they were all made out of upcycled fabric from local thrift stores. And so it was just like, so, oh, I so the where search, I found that fabric. <laughs> so the search for those, I mean, you were searching all over for fabric. I mean, that was half the, the battle of probably of making those bags. Oh, yeah, I was, started, I mean, I, trying to find I started four or five months before Craft Lake City even took place just trying to gather and stockpile the fabric. That was probably the longest, hardest process of it all. So tell us about some of the other events that you've done here locally uh, in Salt Lake, the Salt Lake area, as well as, as you, I know you've uh, done a few other events. Uh, yeah, tell, tell us I a do. little bit about I, those. So Craft Lake City is an annual event, so that's once a year. And then probably the next thing that I found after Craft Lake City was an event called Craft Sabbath. And it's actually a really cool event. It used to be over at this local coffee shop downtown called No Brow, but then we kind of outgrew that as the event grew, and the woman running it at the time was able to sign a contract with the big downtown library to hold it at every month, and so we moved over there, and it's just, it's an awesome event. It's a little bit um, smaller scale. There's usually about 30 vendors that and, vend every month. And that's the first Sunday of every month. Yeah, it's the first, first Sunday of every month. And it's it's all sorts of stuff. I'm the only clothing vendor, but they have um, original paintings, jewelry, um, a lot of uh, bath stuff, like lotions and soaps, and a local tea company usually sells their stuff there, and a 
local chocolate company. That's neat. That's 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 and that's from the first Sunday of every month from first one to Sunday, from one to five, and it's just in the yeah, downtown the library. Downtown library. That sounds. You can go rent your books and. And and currently you, you're stuff. selling every Saturday at the downtown farmers market. Down yeah, Pioneer Park. I started that last year, and so this is my second year doing it, and it runs the farmers market runs from June to October, uh -huh. and so. I do that every June to October. And oh, excellent. And and what has the reception been like from the people in Salt Lake? I mean, the, they've been pretty receptive of 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 your clothing. I'm I'm assuming. Oh I yeah, know. like I I love doing farmers market. It's it's probably one of my favorite things that I do, just because the amount of uh, traffic that that market gets. It's just a huge market. It spans the perimeter of an entire city block. And it's half uh, local farm stuff. <laughs> that sounds silly, but like food and uh, produce and prepared foods and stuff. And then the other half is all handmade artisan craft type things. Excellent. And uh, since you are self-employed, um, you know, sorry, Clementine is your full-time business. It takes a certain kind of person to to be able to Absolutely. to pull something <laughs> like that off. What what motivates you? What what gives you that drive to to create on a daily basis and and not you know not not just sit back and 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 just watch the clouds float by per se? I guess you would say what it definitely takes a certain personality to be able to be self employed in general. Like whether you're a self employed graphic designer, a self-employed house cleaner, I mean, being self-employed and being self-reliant on yourself, first and foremost, it is hard, like, it takes a lot of self-discipline, but for me, I mean, there's not just one motivating factor, there's, I mean, really, there's a ton, but some of the main ones are, like, one of the biggest things that motivates me is how much I love being my own boss. Mm, there's a satisfaction there. <laughs> Huge satisfaction and it's like I've I've worked other jobs. I've I've worked a lot of like retail management type jobs and it's like I just my personality type I have a hard time working for other people and it's hard for me. It's like at a lot of jobs if it doesn't really matter sometimes if you're willing to work harder you're going to get that same hourly wage no matter how hard you work during that hour. And for me, like, that was really unmotivating and really unappealing. Making somebody else richer, more or less, really. Yeah, you're making other people money, and it, it doesn't matter if you're willing to work harder. And, like, for me, I'm willing to work hard, and I'm willing to put in those hours, and... And you put in some long hours. Absolutely. I mean, there's a lot of weeks that I work 60, 70 hours a week. Yeah, like, literally. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and, like, I, I I enjoy doing it, and I like working hard, and I like seeing the benefits of working hard. Um, some of the other things that motivate me is my, my pure love for doing what I do. I can't think of anything that I would rather be doing. And I get a lot of satisfaction. Um... I get a lot of satisfaction from getting to hang out and meet my customers, and that's why I love selling on a local basis. I love selling on Etsy too, but it takes a little bit of the. There's not that that. There's not eye that, contact. There's not that, that, friendship. that friendship. There's no camaraderie. Yeah. It's like so, there's been people that have started buying things from me locally that like I'm just friends with now mm. because they're so rad and awesome. And I had a couple customers that have been buying from me for a long time. They came to my last birthday party. Like, and that's all. That's awesome. It's been really that's... fun to see that. But I just really love seeing. Um, it's like a community you're building, oh, yeah. really, a, a, a friendships and, and community. For sure, I love. I just love seeing a customer come and their eyes kind of you know widen a little bit and they get really excited, and especially when they buy something or they try it on, or you know at at a prior event they bought something and then they came and found me again and just even hearing them say oh I love you know wearing that shirt I bought from you and I get so many compliments on it like that's probably the biggest thing that I love is getting getting to make other people feel good about what they're wearing absolutely and, 
um, besides sewing and sorry Clementine, what when you do have some free time, what 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 sort of things do you enjoy doing and and, and spending your time doing? Um, I like to sew other things besides uh, clothing for my company. Um, I've just even in the last year, I've taken on a few different projects like those Craft Lake City bags we mentioned, and then um, last Halloween I sewed my friend Jimmy a big furry dog costume. Which was that awesome. show, Wilfred. It was awesome. Um, I just like doing silly stuff like that. I like to make little toys for my nieces and nephews, little stuffed monsters with weirdo faces, and I just. So I it's safe to say you're a pretty artistic, creative person, really. I mean, yeah, I like that. all that stuff in general. I like to paint. I'm not like the world's best painter or well, anything, whatever. but <laughs> I enjoy it, <laughs> and I. Just even photography, I love taking photos. There's just a lot of things that I enjoy. A lot of them tend to come from that whole creative realm of things. But I also love um, thrifting. Utah and Salt Lake have some of the most amazing thrift stores and like quantity of thrift stores. Hmm. It's it's pretty much a thrifter's collector's dream. And then I really like going to concerts and going to see bands that I love play live. I've, what are some of your favorite bands? I mean what I mean you oh could tell Lord. you could tell a lot about somebody musically. I mean For sure. what are some of the music I, you've been listening to lately? My music taste like runs the gamut. I feel like I love everything from Johnny Cash to Guns N' Roses and Motley Crue to Brian Adams and Bright mm. Eyes and AFI, Alkaline Trio. Like I like a lot of punk rock. I like a lot of um, 80s metal, older and country. I've, since I, I mean, I've, I've known you a long time, and, and I know you've seen a lot of live bands. What would you say your favorite concert was? Your favorite live show favorite was? Favorite concert. The, the one of the one of the most memorable ones in your. Well, I've seen even just recently. Um, I went and saw Ryan Adams down in L.A. and like that. Um, that was a great show. That huh? really stands out in my brain, but especially when I was younger, I remember. I don't even know how many years ago this was at this point, probably 13, 14 years ago, um, Rancid came and played at Bricks, and AFI was opening for them, <laughs> and I know it sounds silly, but it's just like, so the power kept going out during AFI set, and it got all screwy and whatever, but they finished their set just playing it totally acoustic, no... Nothing being amplified or anything. That was really cool. And Davey Havoc, he's definitely has his theatrics going on stage, but then it was just very eerie and creepy and fit with their vibe, and especially for being like this 15, 16 year old kid that's like super obsessed with that band, it was just really cool to see, and it sticks out in my mind. But I mean, I've seen so many awesome bands come through Salt Lake, old uh, basement of DV8 shows, like Groovy Ghoulies and. I mean, Salt Lake definitely. What's your What's your it, overall? Uh, what, what What's some of your favorite things about living in Salt Lake? I mean, Salt Lake is a great city. I mean, there's so many awesome things here. What are some of your favorite things? For me, I feel like one of the best things about Salt Lake is the accessibility of the city. Mm. Um, I mean, even silly things down to even like parking. Yeah. Like, I've, we take that I've, for granted. <laughs> oh yeah, like I've spent time in other cities. I've lived. Uh, I used to live on the east coast just outside of Boston and it was just like even to go to a concert in Boston you're gonna pay more for parking almost than you did for the ticket to see the show and it's just you have to pay to park anywhere yeah. and we have so much free parking and that kinda goes along the lines of just it being an accessible city you know we get awesome touring bands we have a really cool art scene a really cool music scene um, and I definitely feel like Salt Lake, it's, it's almost that perfect size where it's not little, but it's not huge to the point of like, there's still like bars that I can go to where I know half the people there. It's like a little mm, family. Yeah. Um, you don't get swallowed up like in other big cities. Yeah. Like you can definitely make a name for yourself here and forge your own little path. And it's, it's just at that size. And I feel like it's it's about to get a whole lot bigger and crazier, but right now it's... So you see a lot of people kind of coming out of the woodwork 
new new uh, new crafters, designers, people, well, just how bigger, people making stuff happen. How bigger everything's gotten just even since I've been involved and I've only been involved like selling my clothing for the past four years but do you think even a lot of that maybe is because of things like the social media the Twitter and the Facebook and the, and the Instagram and, and I definitely think that helps I think it's also people just having an idea and trying to run with it yeah um I've seen even... But, but that constant connection, I mean, you're, you're constantly connected online, so well, it gives you that... Well, you're able to promote. Yeah, you're like, able to promote, you're able to You're to able inspire. to get the word out about your, the thing, yeah. like, even those two events, Craft Lake City and Craft Sabbath, they were both just started by, you know, one woman had an idea, and she decided to make it happen. Yeah. And I see that a lot with a lot of different people, if it's just... Well, even like what I'm trying to do with this podcast, I mean, it's, it's the same it's, thing it's, it's, where yeah. people are having an idea and just going for it and things that maybe weren't even around in Salt Lake. I mean, even down to little like food carts on the corner. Mm. I yeah, you didn't see, you didn't see that decade. In, yeah, I yeah. mean, even less than that of 10 years ago, there were not food carts. There were no street vendors of any kind in downtown and just and if there was, slowly, people were like, "What? What's that?" You know. Yeah. You know, it's just. But slowly, it's just like people are starting to do more. I feel like. Absolutely, there's been a lot of really cool things starting to happen up here. Well, where do you see the future? Sorry, Clementine. Where Where do you see yourself in the next couple of years? Um, um, what direction would you like to to see yourself go? I mean. I'd really. I'd like to be able to do this on a bigger scale. Hmm. I think that I'm. I'm at that point where it's kind of that whole like growing pains thing mm -hmm. where I there's only so many hours in a day and I only have two hands. Yeah. And so I, I feel like I'm doing the most that I can right now and I'm as me as one person I feel like I've I'm almost to the point where I can't grow without um, doing something a little bit differently and maybe bring some other people on board. But really, my end goal is to have a, a local shop in Salt Lake. Which would be awesome. Um, there's a couple different areas that I really like, but I would like to have um, a shop that's pretty much an in-house design company mm. that's um, work in the back and selling in the front. And... Um, down the road, I'd like to employ um, a few seamstresses, and maybe I could shift more to just the design portion. And um, I'd like to create local jobs and keep it all local. I don't really. There's been a few local co clothing companies that have existed. They've come and gone, and um, a lot of outsourcing and having their things sewn overseas. And it's that help keeps costs down and everything. But I still feel I feel like people can. It's make their it's money important and keep to keep it your local. money. It's important to keep your money local. You really, you really uh, can see it. When well, absolutely. It and it's like there's people here that want to work and that aren't working. That aren't working. Yeah, and absolutely. I, I, that's, that's I mean, I would want to keep everything. Like I don't see Sorry Clementine ever sell selling clothing that wasn't produced in Utah. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, Speaking of that, um, I mean, before we wrap things up here, I mean, is there anything you'd like to add uh, that maybe we haven't covered or, or not really? I mean, are really um, any 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 cool things coming up here in the next in the next month or two? I mean, it's um for I mean, me, I'm gonna keep doing uh, the farmers market every Saturday. That goes through October. Through October, and then I'm really looking forward to even. It sounds crazy. It's only August, and thinking about like Christmas and stuff. But I'm really looking forward to. There's a few uh, fun holiday boutiques that I do. I really love. It's down in Provo, but it's called the Beehive Bazaar. That's fun. And yeah. that's always a really fun one to do. But um, for me, like just at the moment, I'm looking forward to the season changing and getting to make fun fall and winter stuff. That's I definitely. Um, yeah, I always hear you say that's your favorite stuff to make, the hoodies yeah. and the long sleeves in the winter I love doing stuff. that stuff. Yeah. I love summer stuff too, but I definitely I get really excited about fall and winter things. It's just even that, that feeling of, you know, 
putting on a cozy hoodie and, you know, that whole vibe. Yeah. So I'm just looking forward to all of that. Awesome, awesome. Well, I really appreciate you uh, coming on to the uh, show today, the podcast. And s- since you don't have an actual storefront, what is the easiest way for people to find out where you're going to be next or to find out more about you? The easiest place is probably Facebook. Um, it's facebook.com slash sorry clementine. If it's sometimes easier just to go, I do have a website, it's sorry clementine.com, and that links up to pretty much everything Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, there's links for all of that. And if you want to know more information about me personally, there's um, some information about me on there. But like current, super up to the date, even today I posted a few things on there. Definitely um, liking my Facebook page is the way to go. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Suzanne. And thank you, Chris. I, I wish the best. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll kind of wrap it up there. Awesome. Thanks. All right, that's going to do it for episode one of the I Am Salt Lake podcast. Again, I can't urge you enough to check us out online at IamSaltLake.com. Get in touch with us, let us know what you think, and uh, get in touch with us if you'd like to be a guest on our show. Again, IamSaltLake.com. My name is Chris Hollifield. Remember to subscribe to us on iTunes so you don't miss a single episode. And until next time, remember that it only takes one person to make a difference in Salt Lake City.